Here I have two knots, but the question is, are they the same knot or are they different knots? If I try and untangle the first, I end up with just a circle, what we sometimes call the unknot. But if I try and untangle the other, no matter what I do, I always end up with some knot remaining. This one is called the trefoil. In knot topology, we develop mathematical tools that allow us to answer questions like this one of whether two different looking knots are truly the same. My thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video, more about them at the end. To be a bit more precise, a knot like this one is a continuous embedding of a circle into three-dimensional space, together with the provision that I'm allowed to wiggle it around a little bit. I can't cut it, but otherwise I can maneuver it like you'd imagine that I could with a, an actual piece of rope. Then a knot diagram is a projection of this three-dimensional knot down into a two-dimensional plane like this one, where it's not quite a projection because if I take any crossing and zoom in on it, then I want to be clear about which portion of the rope is on the top and which portion is on the bottom, and I had to indicate that in my drawing as I've done here. So then the equivalence problem is, if I start with two different knot diagrams like this, do they originate from the same knot or from a different knot? Remembering that I could have taken that original knot and moved it around with my fingers, projected it perhaps onto a different plane. So it could be the case that these two knot diagrams, despite looking very different, actually started from the same knot. But how could I know? How could I program a computer, for instance, to be able to distinguish between these two different knots? Now, fortunately, we have a very powerful tool in knot topology called Reitermeister moves. And the idea of a Reitermeister move is it's a very precise way that I can manipulate a knot diagram. And there's basically three different moves. The first Reitermeister move is that if somewhere in my knot diagram I have just an isolated twist, I can untwist it. it makes sense. This is a perfectly logical move that I can do. I've sort of eliminated a crossing from the knot diagram, but I clearly haven't changed the actual knot. The second rider measure move is if I have two loops that are getting close to each other, I can actually send one over top of the other, thus creating two different knot crossings. That's exactly the same thing as well. I can undo it in precisely the same way. Third one is if I have three different threads crossing over, but there's one on the top, like this green one here is clearly on top of both the blue and the yellow, then I can slide the one on top to the other side. Likewise, if the green one was on the bottom of the blue and the yellow, I could slide it underneath to the other side. So the point is, I have three different manipulations that I can do to a knot diagram, and each of those manipulations seems entirely reasonable. And if you apply a sequence of Reitermeister moves in succession, you can begin with a complicated knot, apply all of these Reitermeister moves one after another, and end up with, hopefully, a simpler knot. And it turns out that I only need these three Reitermeister moves. That is, there is a theorem that says two different knot diagrams both represent the same knot if and only if there is a sequence of Reitermeister moves that goes from the one to the other. Using Reitermeister moves, we can construct a whole table of different types of knots. And the idea of this table is it's indexed by the number of crossings in the knot. For example, there's only one knot with no crossings, the unknot. There's only one knot that has three crossings, that's the trefoil. But as you go up in the number of crossings, there's more and more knots that are actually distinct from each other. For example, knots with 23 crossings, there's actually over a hundred billion possible examples of just 23 crossings. And it's been shown that none of these knots on this table are representing the same knot. Every one of them is different. But how exactly? That is, we know that if we can find a sequence of Reitermeister moves between two different knots, then certainly they're the same. But what if you just haven't found a sequence yet? How can you show that, in fact, it's not possible that these, these two knots cannot be the same? Consider, for example, these two knots. The top one is 10 crossings, the bottom has nine. But that's not necessarily a problem because as we know, the Reitermeister moves can change the number of crossings. Now, you could pause and try to think about Reitermeister moves you could do and see if you could take one and manipulate it to the other. But suppose you never found a sequence of Reitermeister moves. How would you know when to stop looking for such a sequence? So what would be really nice is if there was an upper bound, a, a maximum limit on how many sequences of Reitermeister moves we needed to test until we could say that no, these two knots were different. 
And in fact, there is an upper bound. It just really sucks. The upper bound is a power tower, two to the two to the two to the two, all the way up to n plus n prime, where n is the number of crossings in the first diagram and n prime is the number of crossings in the second. Here's the special part. How many twos in this power tower? Well, it's got a height of 10 to the million to the power of n plus n prime. This is an outrageously enormous upper bound. This upper bound gives us just the length of the possible sequences, and you have to check all the possible sequences of lengths less than this upper bound. It's enormous. It's completely impractical to do in any number of universes that you could imagine. So the problem of taking two knots and deciding whether they're the same or whether they're different is not yet solved just because Reitermeister moves exist and they have an upper bound on how many Reitermeister moves you might have to test for. So instead, I want to introduce something called a knot invariant. Some type of calculation or manipulation I can do that inputs two different knots and outputs, well, something, maybe a number, maybe a polynomial. And if those outputs are different, then it's going to imply that the inputs are different as well. I'll show you the first one. The first one is called tricolorability. Here again is the trefoil knot. This is the only knot with three crossings up to our ability to do Reitermeister moves and so forth. And it has a kind of fancy feature. I can try color it. I can put three different colors on it. And this has the property that at every one of these crossings, all three of the colors are present. Technically, the rules of tricolorability are that for a single link, it uses all three colors. And secondly, that any crossing uses all of one color or all three colors, you're just going to eliminate the possibility of two colors. So this trefoil knot is a tricolorable knot. This is a different knot. It now happens to have four crossings, but that's not going to eliminate the idea that it's tricolorable. But it isn't tricolorable, nevertheless. If I try, for example, I'm going to put the blue, I'm going to put a yellow, I'm going to pink in. I then get this final strand that I've left in white that I need to color one of those three colors, but I can't do it without violating the rule. If I look at the one intersection, I've got pink and blue here, that would mean the white strand should be painted yellow, but if I look at the other one, there's yellow, so I can't paint it yellow, I get a contradiction. So this one is not tricolorable. Now here's where the real magic is. Tricolorability, this binary yes it is or no it is not, is a not invariant. That is, if one knot is tricolorable and the other is not tricolorable, <laughs> it's kind of funny saying the word N-O-T and K-N-O-T all the time in this video, regardless, if those have different values of the property, then they are different knots. How do I show something is a knot invariant? Well, I can use my Rider Meister moves. Let's take the second, for example. I have these two different strands, and the second Rider Meister move is that I can cross them over like this. This looks right now like it's violating tricolorability. Each crossing is supposed to have three colors, not two, right? But if I take this region in the middle and I paint it pink, then the rest of the knot that I haven't drawn here is all the same. But this obeys tricolorability. The two different crossings that I have now are tricolorable. So the point is, if I begin with the knot that is tricolorable, and I do a Reitermeister move to it, it also remains tricolorable. That is what I mean by it being a knot invariant. And I would encourage you to argue maybe down in the comments why the first and third Reitermeister move also is going to be invariant under this tricolorability. Now, tricolorability is great, but it's kind of limited. There's tons of knots that are tricolorable, there's tons of knots that aren't tricolorable, and so this first invariant is not particularly sensitive between different types of knots. So I want to do better, and I'm going to come up with something called the Alexander polynomial, which is a much more sophisticated invariant to be able to tell two different knots apart. I'm going to begin with an oriented knot. It's the same trefoil we've seen before, except I've put an arrow on it to indicate the direction. So this is going to apply to oriented knots that have an orientation like this. So here's how I'm going to define it. The first thing is I'm going to number the crossings. In this case, I have three different crossings, and I'm going to give them specific labels 1, 2, and 3. I then note that I have five different regions defined by this knot in this plane. There's one, two, three, four, and five, the fifth being the whole region outside of it. 
this is a general property that if you have a knot with n crossings, there's n plus two different regions. So I've labeled my crossings, I've labeled my regions, and I'm just gonna keep track of them with those labels. Now what I wanna do is I wanna construct a matrix. This is gonna be a three by five matrix where I sort of think about the rows as being the crossings and the columns being the regions. So the feeling I want you to get is that I'm trying to come up with something very algorithmic, something that really encodes the data of this particular knot into this mathematical structure of a matrix. And it's nice because if I wiggle my knot around, you know, maybe that region one gets bigger or smaller, but because I'm sort of dealing with the combinatorics of how the regions relate to each other and the crossings, that kind of change is gonna be okay. Okay, so how should I fill in my matrix? I'm gonna give you a little bit of a cheat sheet here up in green, and the idea is, I want you to look at which of the strands is the top one and which of the strand is the bottom one. So basically the region to the left of the top thread before the crossing gets a T, region to the right before the crossing gets a minus T and so forth according to that diagram. We're gonna go one by one through the crossings. Let's focus on crossing number one first and I've painted in which is the purple and which is the yellow so I can use my diagram. And so if I bring those numbers down, you can see the four regions that are gonna happen here. And basically here's how I fill out my matrix. I'm looking along the first row for crossing number one in region number one, there's a minus one, so I can move the minus one up. Region number two, there's a T, so I can move it up. Region number three, there's a minus T in it, I move that up. And region number five, there's a one. The only thing is there's five regions, but there is no region four because region four has nothing to do with crossing number one. So I'm just gonna put a zero in there for the matrix. I'll do the exact same thing for region number two. I'll pull in all of the numbers according to my cheat sheet. I put them into a matrix add the zero in the remaining spot. And likewise for crossing number three, I'm going to get a matrix like this. So the details don't really matter all that much. What I really want you to focus on is that I began with a knot and I ended up with a matrix. Now that I have this matrix, I'm gonna do two remaining things to it. The first is I'm gonna get rid of two different columns. You can get rid of any ones you wish here. There's choices involved, but you just need to make sure that they're consecutive regions. So fourth and fifth are consecutive. I'm just gonna get rid of those ones. Then I left with the matrix. The final thing is I'm gonna take the determinant of that matrix and that gives me this polynomial minus t plus t squared minus t cubed. This is the Alexander polynomial of the trefoil knot. But why? why? Why do we care that we have this polynomial? Well, it's because of the following theorem. The Alexander polynomial is one well-defined and two a knot invariant. So what do I mean by well-defined? there were a lot of choices involved. I could label the regions differently, I could label the crossings differently, uh, my choice of which two columns to cut out, I could have done that differently. So basically, the first thing you have to prove is that under all of those choices, you get a well-defined polynomial. Actually, what you get is well-defined up to possibly a multiplication by negative t to some particular power, but other than this, it's a well-defined polynomial. The second piece is also crucial. It is a knot invariant, and you prove it the same way we did with our other knot invariant tricolorability. If you take each of the three Reitermeister moves, and you think, how is that gonna influence the knot diagram? Well, it turns out to not change the Alexander polynomial, something that you need to prove and something you can do down in the comments if you so wish. Regardless, I now have a great answer. If you input two different knots, and they have different Alexander polynomials, they have to be different. And unlike tricolorability, this Alexander polynomial can tell the difference between an enormous number of knots, very sensitive, and so it is great for allowing us to tell two different knots apart. If they have different polynomials, they're different knots. But it's still not perfect. Consider, for example, these two knots. The top is called the Conway knot, the bottom is the unknot, and they both have Alexander polynomial, perhaps surprisingly in the first case, of one. They're not the same. There is no sequence of Reitermeister moves that takes this complicated top one and makes it into the unknot. But the Alexander polynomial cannot tell the difference. So what can we do? 
Well, mathematicians have improved significantly on the Alexander polynomial that first came out in 1923. There is an upgrade to something called the Alexander-Conway polynomial that actually helps its computability. It allows it to be computed in a bit of a different way. There's new polynomials called the Jones polynomials that have different properties in terms of what kinds of knots it can tell the difference of. And work continues to the present day on these kind of polynomial knot invariants. For example, a former professor of mine, Dror Barnett Han, and his colleague Roland Vanderdeen proved a new polynomial invariant that is very strong in the sense that it can look at all different knots of crossing number 10 or less, and it can distinguish all of them apart, but it's also able to be computed in polynomial time. And this is just scratching the surface of all the body of work that can be done and the questions that remain in the field of knot topology. For example, things that can be looked at are links like this one where multiple different ropes are all tied together. Or you could look at knots or links that had sort of specific requirements like all living on the edge of a torus like this one. Or you could consider high dimensional analogs like instead of taking a one dimensional circle embedded in three dimensions, what about a two dimensional sphere embedded in four dimensions? What kind of interesting properties does that have? So there are a lot of interesting questions for the future. As great as math videos can hopefully be, to really improve as a mathematician, you need to be actively wrestling with problems. And that's why I think that Brilliant, which is the sponsor of today's video, is just really effective for your learning. They have a ton of courses on all kinds of subjects, but I was really enjoying working through this course on cool things to do with infinity, and it's just delightfully interactive. Here with the Canter set, you get to be the one playing around with this fascinating mathematical object. Or here with the Hilbert curve. It isn't just that it is beautifully animated so that you can understand it visually. It puts the students in the driver's seat because you get to test and self-assess your learning as you go along and you get meaningful help and feedback when you make mistakes. As a math professor, I know that this is extremely effective pedagogy and that's why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash and sign up for free or the first 200 people to use that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said, if you have any questions or comments about knot topology, leave them down in the comments below and we'll just do more math in the next video.